Hi, Compounders. Today, I would like to review an article appeared on the Financial Times a few years ago by Terry Smith. And I think this is a very good article explaining the limitations of uh, dividend investing in general and why it is important to keep an eye on compounders. So let's go through it uh, in detail and let's comment what he's saying. He writes that equities are unique in the sense that they can compound in value in a way that investments in other asset classes, such as bonds and real estate, cannot. And the reason is that companies retain a portion of the profits they generate to reinvest in the business. He continues by saying that on average, companies pay about half of their earnings in dividends. So the payout ratio is about 50%. The earnings that are not paid out are invested in the business. So the reinvestment rate is 50%. He points out that no other asset class provides this. If you own bonds, you receive an interest payment, but it's not reinvested in the bond. And if you own real estate, you receive rental income, but it's not reinvested in the property for you. So what is the effect of this particular feature of equities is that they compound and let's see in detail how this works. He says the average company in the S&P 500 earned a return on equity capital employed of 13% in 2016. So capital employed is total assets minus current liabilities is one metric that is similar to return on invested capital and other ratios that we can use to assess the profitability of a company. If the company retains half of the earnings and it can continue to invest at its current rate of return, that half should also earn 13%. If the management is distributing half of the earnings, it's because they are not finding good opportunities for those earnings, for that portion, but they are finding good opportunities, hopefully, for the remaining portion. So the return on capital employed or return on total capital, they shouldn't mean revert quickly because if the management is not finding good opportunities, they should just distribute. This is a good capital allocation policy. The point is this. He says, on average, companies in the S&P 500 trade on three times book value. So the price to book is three. So actually this was true in 2017. The price to book went up to 4.5 at the end of 2021, and it's now close to 3.4. But in any case, the point here is the price to book is larger than one on average. So what does it mean? It means that for every dollar of earnings that they retain, they create, he says, three dollars of market value. So in general, they create a multiple and the multiple is the price to book. So then a question that we will address in another video is why is the price to book larger than one? Why the price to book should be three or four or two? This depends actually on the return on uh, capital employed. So suppose that the company makes one dollar of earnings. 50 cents are distributed on average and 50 cents are retained. The price of shares goes up three times the retained component. The return for you as an investor is $2. 50 cents in dividend and $1.5 in capital gain. And he says, this is not the same as the frequently uttered mantra that the majority of return on equities comes from the reinvestment of the dividends paid. So why not? So dividends which are reinvested, because what do you do? When you receive a dividend and you are in the accumulation phase, you reinvest the dividend. One day, maybe you will leave off dividends, but if you receive a lot of dividends and you don't need all of them, what do you do? You reinvest. So dividends which are reinvested have to be used to purchase shares at market value. And so, of course, you have to buy the shares on the market. And so the problem is that the price to book is larger than one, whereas each dollar of retain earnings gets reinvested at book value because the retain earnings increase the book value. So what does it mean? 
Suppose that the dollar of earnings that I was talking about before is completely retained. So it's completely reinvested in the business. The price of the shares will go up $3. So the return for you as an investor would be 3% instead of 2% that we computed before. So he concludes that it is the reinvestment of retained earnings, not dividends, which provide the majority of the growth in the value of equities. This discussion by Terry Smith focuses on the limitation of dividend investing in the sense that if we reinvest the dividends, we cannot expect to get a return that is as large as the return that we could have had by investing in companies which are able to reinvest completely their earnings. Of course, dividend investing has a lot of other good features. So first of all, you have cash in your hands, so you can decide to reinvest it or not. Second of all, cash is a fact, so you are pretty sure that companies with a very long history of dividend growth are solid companies and I think that it simplifies the analysis. But on the other hand, this article by Terry Smith makes it clear that it is a suboptimal way to invest. And he points out that Berkshire Hathaway has not paid a dividend for half a century. So I think that Warren Buffett paid a dividend one time. So this is why focusing on compounders is important. Some of the compounders pay out a dividend. Typically, the payout ratio is not too large because the product of the return on total capital uh, or return on capital employed and the reinvestment rate should give us the growth. So next time I will talk about the relationship between the price to book and the ratios like return on capital employed or return on total capital. For now, if you like this video, please consider subscribing and leave a comment in the section below. Thank you and see you next time. Berkshire has never paid a dividend, as we all know, and consequently you had superior utilization of the extra cash. <coughs> now, if you extend that reasoning, could it also be a beneficial policy if Coca-Cola and Gillette stop paying dividends and utilize the cash in other ways? Well, it depends what they could use it, how they would use, utilize the cash and what they could use it for. Those are more focused enterprises than Berkshire, at least in terms of products. And they, um, I think, I commend managements that have a wonderful business for utilizing cash in those wonderful businesses or in businesses that they understand and will also have wonderful economics and for getting the rest of the money back to the shareholders. So. Coca-Cola in my book is doing exactly the right thing with its cash when it both, when A, <clears throat> it uses all the cash that it can effectively in the business to expand in new markets and all of that sort of thing. But then beyond that, it pays a dividend which re distributes cash to shareholders and then it repurchases shares in a big way, which returns cash on a selective basis to shareholders, but in a way that benefits all of them. So we, you will benefit from us not paying dividends just as long as we can use the every dollar we retain to produce more than a dollar of value and of market value over time. Whether we can continue doing that, you know, how long we can continue doing that, I can't promise you. But that is the that's the yardstick by which the decision is made. <clears throat> and that is the yardstick, I think, by which Coca-Cola is making the decision, too. And I think that they deserve great credit for exercising the discipline to quit when they are uh, using cash when they've run out of the opportunities to use it well and then to use it then to further deploy it advantageously by repurchasing shares.